This is the helmet of a Roman Praetorian guard of the 4th century, a replica but the kind which would have been worn by St. George. St. George, the invincible martyr, one of the most well-known and honoured Christian saints. St. George, who we're told was born in Cappadocia in modern-day Turkey, whose mortal remains rest still in the town of Lydda in Palestine, and who fought valiantly against the dragon of pride, falsehood, and deceit. The St. George who we probably all know as the archetypal hero, the one who rides into danger, thinking not foremost of himself, in a time where others are too weak or too selfish to act, too cowardly to tackle the dragon roaring at their very gates. There's nothing childish or naive about this story. In many ways, it's the story, a story for every age which ought to inspire as much in the man of 50 as it does in the boy of eight. The hero who we may see in a thousand stories, but who existed in history and held a mirror up to the true light. Let's look again at St. George. St. George's story is one of profound courage. A young man, a Roman soldier from a Christian family who ultimately gives up his life for the truth. The stories say that before his torture, he battled a dragon and saved a princess. If you don't know them, then you can find them with a quick Google search. It's a story we all probably know in some form or other, and I want to try to help to lift this story up again. Because this kind of heroic story, the fact that we honour it so, shows us that the key to human flourishing is to go out and to face the unknown. And today we may say that St. George is a hero who actually takes on a thousand faces, to reference Joseph Campbell. That's the modern or postmodern approach to stories like this, to say that it's just an archetype. From what I can surmise, Campbell wasn't actively trying to discredit the stories by analysing them, by reducing them to an almost scientific formula, but in a sense, this is probably what he's done. You are a man of faith. You're, I'm, a, you're a man of wonder. And... Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I don't have to have faith. I have experience. And modernity has left us with an obsession with the newness of things, not the trueness of things. He's disenchanted the stories for a time by making the mythic into the scientific, a formula which storytellers can use time and time again to sell their screenplay. It seems to me, though, in many ways, Campbell's observations are obviously correct. And really, he's recognised patterns and archetypes that do emerge time and time again across the varying cultures of the world. And so what? If I'm painting the picturesque valleys and hills near where I live, I shall use greens and blues on my canvas. And you, who may live thousands of miles away from me, across the ocean, will use those same splashes of colour to paint the place in which you find yourself. Turner painted England, Monet painted France. I experience something that transcends the passing moment in the art gallery when I gaze upon a Monet sunset. The fact that Monet has used the same cadmium red as Turner means absolutely nothing. It's a reoccurring pattern to illustrate something true, eternal, not a scientific formula, a melody, not an electronic beep. So we can accept some of Campbell's conclusions as long as we grasp that we don't have a view from nowhere, floating in the ether, looking down and judging the planet, but instead possess a view from somewhere, from here, from right where you are looking at your screen this very second. Jonathan Peugeot, the thinker, public speaker and orthodox icon carver, makes the point that reality unfolds and appears to us through attention. And broadly, the world is symbolic and our act of attending to it is how reality unfolds all around us. We have to attend to something, not an abstract idea, something or someone. Ceasing to do this, ceasing to accept this leads to all manner of problems, not least being alienated from your world, the one in which you experience together with your friends, your wife or husband, parents and children. And St. George, the soldier saint, the invincible martyr helps us to make this point because we don't look at a hero with a thousand faces. We have to attend to a face, the face, and not reduce that face to an ideal or an idea. Because the debunkers and the cynics, and many of us have had a cup of coffee with them at some time or other, they want to say that nothing is really known about St. George. We don't have a biography from just after his death, circa 303, uh, written on parchment with non-Christian sources to verify the story. And just how can a man battle a dragon? After all, there's no such thing. I have a well-known book here, uh, A Dictionary of the Saints, which you would think 
would probably take a slightly less disenchanted approach to the tradition of this particular saint. Because people have cherished and passed down this story for a tremendous length of time. It's given courage in times of great trials, and trials we in this age can scarcely imagine. But in this book, unfortunately, even in a book by a Christian author, it's the same reductionist, dissecting, materialist approach. Going back to Pajot's point about attention and attending to something tangible, I must look, say, at the helmet akin to that of St. George's. Look at this helmet, because tradition passed down through history tells me that St. George was a soldier. George of Lydda, who belonged to an affluent family, lived an honest life and was martyred during the cruel Diocletian persecutions. Not an idea or a concept. George, who refused to denounce his faith and be forced to accept the base and perverse beliefs of ancient Rome. George, who would remove a helmet like this one for one final time and willingly face torture and death, steadfast in his devotion to the true light of the world. It's tangible, it's real. A name, a face. He's been given a feast day in the calendar, St. George's Day. He's had the respect, the esteem of billions of people. One face, not a thousand. Heroes exist and heroes hold up the world, don't they? Righteous people uphold the world, reality around us, and we live by their examples, the experiences of notable people, the experiences, truths communicated in their stories. Otherwise, there is chaos, breakdown. Richard Rowland mentioned this in an episode of Universal History, how the saints uphold the world. We live by their examples and try to emulate them with humility, but we have to know where to look. It's been popular now for decades to try and debunk everything, to stand in judgment, maybe even to sneer, to pretend we have a view from nowhere. We don't look at ideals or heroes with thousands of faces, otherwise the lens is out of focus. Rather than gazing at a multitude of faces, there's actually nothing to see. We look at this face, and in a difficult world our lives are made all the better for it. The fact that everything has been debunked and put under the microscope is perhaps the very reason we find ourselves in our own lives overanalyzing everything, overthinking everything, and daring not to step forward. Step forward like George of Lydda did. I'm told he fought a dragon somewhere in modern day Libya. I see it in paintings and in magnificent icons of this young man. The fact that he faces the dragon of death in this narrative I'm listening to communicates something profound to me something we may think is cliche today, but it says that I need to be brave and not think first of myself, but of others. We must each be brave and selfless in this life. Is there anything truer than that? I know many modern people, especially Christians, who don't like the imagery of armor and of swords or even of the hero's journey. And Christ tells us clearly that those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. And we all instinctively know this to be so. And this conversation is not about living by such things, but knowing that they have a certain cautious place. One of the highest teachings we've received, after all, is to foremost forgive our enemies. And with that always at the forefront of our minds, it seems to me, nevertheless, that we ought not to shy away from the dangers of the world and understand the place for heroes. These narratives and the imagery therein help us to visualise the conflicts and trials we face, which usually don't demand physical armour, but another kind of armour, as St Paul writes, in his letter to the Ephesians, making use of this imagery himself. And we know that the dragon, a particular dragon, is also referenced by St. John in the book of Revelation. And what do I know about this dragon and St. George? The skeletal remains our ancestors saw? The fictional dinosaurs we see in the Jurassic Park movies? Did they have feathers? The Komodo dragon? The crocodile? A serpent? I'm not expressing an opposition to science, but I'm not going to be so naive as to pretend we possess knowledge which we simply don't. Do I even know what our ancestors understood by a dragon before I dismiss it as a pre-modern fantasy? Do I even know what fantasy is in an age where Middle Earth is more real to so many young men than their own neighbourhoods? Humility, it seems to me, is the key here. Here is the story, and it tells me so much. Let me just listen to it first. And what exactly is worse, facing a ferocious dragon or being tortured by the Romans? Our modern minds can accept the latter, but neither bears thinking about it, does it? Unfortunately, we, at least in the West, shall probably never have to face anything akin to what George of Lydda faced. 
Yet we do need his values and virtues for our own lives, aware that he was a man who imitated Christ in the end and has been forever honoured for it. Within a short time after George's martyrdom and that of countless others, Rome itself became Christian. The mighty Roman Empire, which crucified Jesus of Nazareth like a slave, would come to look to him as the Son of God in what must be the biggest turning of the tables in human history. Whatever we may think of that, we certainly forget how profound it is, as we forget saints like George of Lydda in a smaller way and the profound role that they play. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and share with others.